begin with word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the chance to be gathered together here today to talk about your wonderful gift of baptism. We pray that you would bless us as we listen to your word and seek to understand what what a precious gift you have given to us for the sake of Jesus our Savior. Amen. All right. The um, baptism is a Greek word that you actually know. Um, of course, it may not look exactly like you're used to it, but that says baptismos. Uh, so baptism comes absolutely straight from the Greek, just drops the case endings off the end there. Um, and uh, we're, um, we'll talk about the actual Greek word itself, what it meant and means. Uh, but first we need to start off with um, a couple of concepts that it, if you don't know these, these words, then, you know, somebody would say, well, are you really Lutheran? <laughs> um, starting off with the uh, concept of means of grace. Means of grace. And what that is talking about is, okay, there's this truth that Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sins. That is an absolute truth that kind of, if you want to think of it as just kind of existing in the universe, it's out there um, for us. But how does that get inside of me as an individual Christian? You know, how, do, how does this truth that God loves me get inside of me? You're well acquainted, I'm sure, with the difficulty of communicating from one human being to another. Um, we, uh, how many times have you thought that somebody um, really didn't like you at all and found out that they were very fond of you? Or, unfortunately, <laughs> maybe with a stab in the back, vice versa, right? Um, so... You know, here is, is God with all this love for us and this accomplished, finished truth that Jesus died on the cross for us. Got to get it inside here somehow. Now, um, that is the work, the Bible tells us, of the Holy Spirit to get that truth into our hearts. But how does he, how does he do that? Well, we could imagine him doing it in a lot of ways. <clears throat> we could imagine um, God doing it by dream, you know. In the middle of the night, I, I have a vision. Uh, and certainly God did use visions. So we know that from the Bible to communicate certain things. He didn't, however, make any promises to use visions to communicate this truth to us. Or a voice from heaven. God sometimes spoke in a voice from heaven. We talked about that with the Ten Commandments. But God doesn't promise to speak to us through a voice from heaven. Um, there are, however, some ways that God does promise to communicate to us. And those are the things we call the means of grace. Let me put it another way. <clears throat> I want a taco. And somewhere in Wisconsin, they are making cheese. And somewhere in Missouri, they are fattening beef cattle. And somewhere in Iowa, they are growing corn. And somewhere in South Florida, they're growing lettuce and tomatoes. And somewhere over in the East Indies, there are spices growing. <clears throat> but that doesn't do me any good. <laughs> it's true, but it's not doing me any good until Taco Bell gathers that stuff from all of those places and I walk into their Taco Bell store and they've brought, you know, with planes and ships and trucks and everything else and they have gotten all of that stuff together and there's somebody behind the counter who wraps it all up inside a piece of paper and puts it in a bag and hands it to me, 
Okay? Now, I'm not saying that God is like Taco Bell, but it's the same thing. When something is out there, it's got to get to me somehow. So um, what I am saying, I guess, is that when we talk about the means of grace, in a way, we're talking about a delivery system. How God delivers his love into our lives. Lutherans believe, because this is what we've discovered from the Bible, that there are um, basically that, that the ways that God has promised to deliver his love into our lives are through his word and through the sacraments. Those are the two things we can count on. I mentioned a couple that we can't. Visions, voice from heaven, things like that. Um, but we can count on these because there are direct promises in the Bible that he will bring faith to us through the word and sacraments. Um, you know, uh, Romans 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know, um, Baptism now saves you. Um, this is my body, this is my blood for the forgiveness of sins. These are the kinds of words I've been skipping around in here that, that promise to us that God will deliver his grace by means of word and sacraments. So the means of grace then, that equals the word and sacraments. <clears throat> the word meaning, of course, you know, God's holy word for us in the Bible, the sacraments, we, um, as Lutherans, we, we use a narrower definition of this word than some Christians do. When the Lutherans were um, having their discussions with uh, the, the Pope and his followers uh, in the early days of the church, the, uh, the list of sacraments was seven. You had baptism, you had uh, the Lord's Supper, or Holy Communion, you had uh, confirmation, ordination into the priesthood, marriage, um, Holy unction, uh, extreme rites it's called sometimes. And one, two, three, four, five, six. And the seventh one was called penance. Okay. Um, now the Lutherans never fussed about that list. We never had any trouble with having a list and calling these things sacraments. But what... Um, what you find in the Lutheran confessions was that the Lutherans said, okay, these are all fine, wonderful, sacred actions, but the Lutherans insisted we must distinguish among them because they have different value to them. The Lutherans uh, basically came up with the narrower definition of sacrament to say it had three elements. One, that this the sacrament would uh, be instituted by God himself. In other words, it wouldn't be something that the church came up with, but something that the Bible records is instituted by God himself. Two, that there would be some visible element attached to this sacrament. And three, that it would convey to us the forgiveness of sins. So those are the, uh, the three characteristics of what Lutherans count in, in their narrower definition of sacraments. Now, 
what that means is that we'll just kind of go through this list. Baptism is certainly instituted by God himself. When Jesus was about ready to go into heaven, he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? Um, a visible element, of course. Baptism has that. Conveys the forgiveness of sins. We'll be talking about some of the Bible passages that communicate that. So baptism fits all three of these. Therefore, Lutherans count baptism as a sacrament in our narrower definition of the word. Holy Communion, instituted by God himself, well, our Lord Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed took bread, okay? Uh, visible element, that's easy, bread and wine. Conveys the forgiveness of sins, well, that's what Jesus says, for the forgiveness of your sins, okay? So, there we go. Confirmation is purely invented by the church. There's no record of it in the Bible, so it... it it doesn't have one. Um, visible element, yeah, you could say it, it has a visible element. Uh, usually in the Roman Catholic Church there was an anointing with oil. Conveying the forgiveness of sins, no, it doesn't. Ordination is not instituted by God himself. Um, there is the laying on of hands in the Bible in several places, but the actual process of ordination is not defined there. Uh, a visible element, uh, you could perhaps say there is. Conveying the forgiveness of sins, no, that's not there either. Marriage is instituted by God himself. Marriage does not have a visible element. You can get married without a ring or any other sign, um, and does not convey the forgiveness of sins. It certainly requires the forgiveness of sins, but it doesn't convey the forgiveness of sins. Holy unction, um, well, you could talk in terms of instituted by God, but not really, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's, there is mention, again, of anointing with oil in the Bible, but it's really not an institution by God. There is a visible element. Um, does not really convey the forgiveness of sins because there's no promise from God that it conveys the forgiveness of sins. And then when you get to the last one, um, if you talk in terms of Roman Catholic penance, um, you really fall short here. Um, but if you talk uh, of penance in the way that Lutherans talk about confession and absolution, then you would have instituted by God, that is, the, um, you know, Jesus, uh, when he came, rose, rose again from the dead, did tell the disciples to forgive the sins of penitent sinners, and not to forgive the impenitent. Um, there is no visible element attached to, the, to that, but it definitely does convey the forgiveness of sins. So, Lutherans <coughs> basically then, in talking through the seven sacraments that Roman Catholics would talk about, we would say that, um, basically, confirmation, ordination, um, and holy unction, because they're not instituted by God, belong in kind of a um, bottom level, um, still can be wonderful, useful things that, you know, you do in the Lutheran Church too, but are, are, are not, don't really have these promises attached to them. Marriage, because it's instituted by God, maybe is in a kind of a second tier there, and the sacrament of penance or um, confession and absolution gets, uh, you know, gets an asterisk here with an asterisk, <laughs> you know, because it's missing the visible element. So um, that's how the Lutheran confessions handle the sacraments. They basically count us as having two sacraments with penance being, you know, having the same basic function, but um, operating on a slightly different level. And so we'll be talking about this later on, 
Today we're going to talk about baptism. Next week we'll be talking about communion. All right. Um, so, what we're saying here is that in baptism, in Holy Communion, and in Confession and Absolution, God promises to deliver His grace into our lives. We can go to His Word and find passages that say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring the love of Christ. I'm going to bring forgiveness of sins. I'm going to bring reconciliation between God and man into your life through these sacraments as also through my word. So, um, now the, the thing that's being brought into our lives through word and sacrament is the same throughout. Okay, it isn't like um, baptism does one thing for me and the preaching of the word does a different thing and Holy Communion does yet another thing. Uh, they all bring God's forgiveness into my life. But that's, in a way, that's like saying um, that uh, a, uh, a steak and a uh, candy bar and a salad bring the same thing into my life too. They all bring nutrition to me. But the delivery system itself, the, the, the means of delivering it, um, is, you know, varies quite a bit. Um, in, in baptism, God delivers his forgiveness into my life um, by, you could almost say, an exercise of his raw power. He's the one who's doing something. I might not even know that he's doing something as, you know, a, a, as an infant being baptized, for example. Um, and yet he's doing something with lasting force for the rest of my life. Uh, on the other hand, when I hear the word preached, my brain is very much engaged and involved in that. Um, and when I receive the Lord's Supper, um, that's, that's yet another thing that's going on there. So we'll, we'll kind of talk about those differences. Uh, but it's, but the, the end product is the same. I have God's forgiveness living inside of me through all of these things. Um, all right, well... Let's talk about the, uh, the Greek word baptismos here. Uh, baptizo is the, uh, the verb form. To baptize, um, and I guess actually that's, that's going to also look the same here. Um, when I say, you know, the Greek words here. Um, that comes straight, you know, if you drop the, the endings, in this case, the noun endings, in this case, the verb endings, you have exactly the English word, baptize, baptism. Uh, to baptize means to put under the water. Now, in the earliest days that we have Greek literature recorded, that would mean to completely submerge in water, like a ship sinking to the bottom of the ocean would be baptized as completely submerged under the water. However, by the by, a thousand that's you know that would be like uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, you know Homer, a thousand years before Jesus. But by the time we get to Jesus, um, the word is being used for being under the water in any way, okay? So if um, I take that pitcher of water and start pouring it on top of you, um, you know, like a, like a coach at the end of a, of a football game or something, you know, he's being baptized, you know, um, by, that, by being under the water. Um, 
if I place my hands under a running faucet, that would be the same thing going on there in the usage that we know existed in Jesus' time. So uh, the word had gone from um, implying complete submersion in a body of water to water being even sprinkled on a tabletop here in order to clean the tabletop. If I uh, took, uh, took some water and just sprinkled some out there and then wiped it up with the thing, um, the sprinkling with the water would be a baptism. We find that usage even in, uh, even in the New Testament. Um, you may have, uh, you may remember, may not remember that Jesus talks about, or uh, gospel writers talk about that the Pharisees, whenever they came in from the marketplace, would wash their hands. The word is baptize their hands. That's what's there in the Greek. Um, they would come in and, and usually a servant would take a pitcher and would pour running water and they would put their hands under the running water and to translate that as wash um, is, is in a way accurate and in a way not. Because when you and I think of washing our hands, we think of you know soap and water and, and getting all of the grime off. The, the Pharisees were actually doing something different. It was a ceremonial washing. It was not necessarily for cleansing, although certainly some of that would have happened at the same time. Um, so uh, the word itself is just a, a word you could use in any context in the, in the Greek world. Christians use it in a very specific context to talk about... Um, something other than like when you wash your hands. Um, and that usage uh, we can trace a little bit, um, starting with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a group that um, arose in the intertestamental period in between Malachi at the end of the Old Testament and when Jesus came. Um, that's a span of about 400 years um, you know, if, we, if we take our timeline that we drew at the beginning of class and take a little section out of it, we have Malachi here, and we have Jesus here, um, and this is 400 B.C., and this is the, the change of the era from B.C. to A.D. Then, again, if we do our, our little fun thing of splitting and making this then um, 200 and 300 and 100. And then we'll split here again at 150. Um, during this time period right here um, is when the Pharisees arose. What happened was that the Holy Land was being ruled from right in here on, <clears throat> not by the Romans, but by the Greeks. You might remember a particularly famous Macedonian Greek that um, was quite busy in the world named Alexander. Alexander the Great conquered the entire Mediterranean region and was headed toward India when he died of a sudden illness. Um, and when Alexander died, the, having conquered, including the Holy Land, um, he left behind four generals who split his kingdom into four pieces. Um, and the, the general that ruled in the area of the Holy Land then, and his, uh, those who, who uh, inherited his reign, those guys were reigning in this time. <clears throat> well, you get down into this period, and there was a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes, ruling in here, who was about as bad as they can get. He hated the Jewish people passionately and did everything he could to make their lives totally miserable. 
And it finally got to the point where he decided he was going to do <clears throat> the worst thing he could imagine to them. And so he went into the rebuilt temple. And of course, no one but a Jewish person was supposed to go into the temple. And he went into the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest was supposed to go. And that was only once a year. And on the altar inside the Holy of Holies, he slaughtered a pig. Which, of course, is the most unclean among all the unclean animals to the Jewish people. So he basically totally violated everything. I mean, you could not imagine the worst thing that someone could do to you as an individual. The thing that would be the most hateful, horrible thing. Um, uh, do you remember uh, the novel 1984? It would be in your history books for you younger people. Um, but in, in it, um, the, uh, the main character is finally caught and, and they're, they're going to rehabilitate him. They're going to break him. And he stands up to every kind of torture or is able to. He knows he can stand up to any kind of torture except the one thing. I don't know if you remember what it was, but he had this deathly fear of rats. And when they brought the rats, he said, do it to her, you know, the girl in the story. And that's when he truly was broken, because they had found his greatest horror. That's what they did to him. Well, that's what Antiochus Epiphanes did to the Jewish people. Uh, his intent was to break them utterly. The result was quite different. There were a group of them that said, you know what? This serves us right. Because we have not been living like God calls us to live. We have not been doing the things that we should be doing. And it serves us right. And we are going to stop living this horrible life that is separated from God, that has brought us this low, and we are going to start keeping the law of God. And so they did. They were led by a guy named Judas Maccabeus. Um, and if you've ever seen a listing of the books in the Apocrypha, you know there are several books of the Maccabees that tell the story of the Maccabean revolt then. Um, Judas Maccabeus and others... Um, led this movement to um, return back to God's law, to regain the strength that comes from following God, and then they revolted against this horrible character and actually were successful. Um, so it was out of that history that the Pharisees came. Unfortunately, by Jesus' time, like many movements, this movement had gone awry. What happened was that they figured that all of, all of the good things that were happening, they had brought about by their keeping of the law. And they began to um, add laws to laws to laws, adding these traditions that they had come up with, and finally wound up with the 613 commandments that I had talked to you about previously, um, some of which, which were the Ten Commandments, some of which were in the Bible, and others were just their made-up rules. And by the time Jesus came along, the Pharisees were basically saying, we are the holy ones. In fact, the, the word Pharisee comes from the Hebrew word that means to separate out. We're the holy ones who are separated out, different from everybody else. And uh, I'm going to say he's good. <laughs> Usually if you say you're going to sneeze, it doesn't happen. Oh, um, <clears throat> They had developed this sense of we're the holy ones and everybody else is not. And so 
they developed this concept of baptism then with uh, the idea that if, you'll see my great artwork here, okay, that if I'm a Pharisee, I live in this kind of cocoon of holiness, and all around me, all of the other people, they're, they're horrible, they're bad, they're sinners, and I'm not. Well, when I step out of my little cocoon and go into the marketplace and so forth, then I'm out here with all these, these horrible people, and they kind of infect me, uh, they, they diminish my holiness because I've been out there among them. And so when I get back to my home then, and back into my little cocoon of holiness, I need to wash off their sin from me. Or when I become a Pharisee, I've been living out here amongst all these horrible people, and when I come into the group of the Pharisees, I need to wash off all their dirt that's on the outside of me. And so the Pharisees then, um, part of their initiation into being a Pharisee was that you would be baptized. And that's what they called it. Um, the concept to wash other people's dirt off. off of my outsides. Okay, so that's the Pharisees. John the Baptist came along, sent by God to prepare the people for, um, for the coming of Jesus. And he started baptizing totally differently. John said, the problem is not the dirt that's on the outside of you from other people. The problem is what's inside your heart. And so John had a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. If you came to John, you listen to his preaching, you recognize that the problem was inside of you, and you said, I am sorry, I want to be right with God again. And John would welcome you down into the water to be baptized, to um, essentially, I don't want to use the word symbolize, because I think more was going on there than that. John was doing something God had sent him to do. Um, he very specifically said, John, God sent me to baptize a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So I'd say it's more than a symbol, but it was a very powerful symbol also. But John said that someone else is going to come along, and of course he points out Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he said, he is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So, basically this concept of baptism, of Christian baptism, like John's, rejects this concept. When the Pharisees came out to John, he said, what are you doing here, you bunch of snakes? Who warned you? Um, he, 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 he really preaches, you know, fiery, <laughs> hard words to the, to the Pharisees. He rejects their baptism altogether. So the baptism of John is this baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And he says Jesus is going to add this Holy Spirit and fire. So that Christian baptism then is basically John's baptism completed by not only the taking away of my sin, but putting inside of me 
the Holy Spirit of God. So now, instead of what we've been seeing with the Pharisees here, what we've got instead is that the problem is inside my heart, which is full of sin, and God takes away the sin and replaces it with his Holy Spirit. So that's, that's the change that occurs as, as baptism develops from uh, the Pharisees who had the outward form, but the content was totally off to John, who had the introductory message to finally Jesus, who fulfills all things. All right. So that's, that's just kind of the history, and we'll come back in then and, and get all of this sorted out. All right, so anybody would know that baptism is uh, has to do with water. I mean, that's just in, in the word itself. Um, when Luther uh, starts his explanation of holy baptism, he says it's not simple water only, but it is the water that is, um, well, I always go back to the old catechism words, uh, connected with God's word, uh, comprehended in God's word, and uh, baptism is not simple water only, with water. Uh, anyhow, oh, read it out of your catechism because now I'm halfway getting the new words in there. Yes, it is. <laughs> comprehended God's word and connected. Uh, anyhow. The old catechism used the words comprehended and connected, and the new one is like included and the first part of baptism there. Water included in God's command and combined with God's word. Included in God's command and combined with God's word. The old one said comprehended in God's command and connected. Now I can't even think of it anymore. That the point being, <clears throat> um, there is this command from Jesus to baptize, and there is this um, this word of God that talks to us about what's happening there, that we are receiving this gift of a new life with Christ, um, of the washing away of our sins, and, and a new life with Christ. So if you want to think of uh, baptism in this way, kind of in the, what does it take away? It takes away my sins. What does it add? It adds the new life in Christ, and we'll get to that as we get to the end of uh, Luther's explanation here. Um, and then Luther quotes the words uh, of institution of baptism, um, the setting Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Um, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey whatever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Okay, that's the very end of the Gospel of Matthew. Um, that's called the Great Commission. And you'll notice that the Great Commission includes... Um, what sounds like oops, thank you, Linda. <laughs> um, sounds like it's got several imperatives in it. It doesn't really. Um, we we hear go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Um, baptizing. And teaching. Okay? It looks like in English 
there are two imperatives here and two participles. Actually, there's one imperative, um, one indicative, or, or actually one, one imperative and three uh, participles. <clears throat> if you want to fix this in English, it's going, or as you go, okay? So there's no command to go. And some, you know, there have been some preachers that have made this great, you know, emphasis on go, but it's not there. It's as you go, while you're going. The idea is <clears throat> that as Christians, we're going to be moving constantly, and wherever we are moving, wherever we are going, we should make disciples. Uh, if, you, if you leave it as an imperative there, it sounds like everybody's supposed to go to some foreign mission field. Nobody's going to stay home. <laughs> you know, if this command is given to all Christians, it makes it sound like, um, you know, you have to, to all, like a nuclear explosion, you know, you go out from the center. But, um, but the command is simply as you go. Um, as you go to the grocery store as you go to school, as you go to work, as you go to church, as you go take a walk around Lake Eola. All of that is wrapped up in the Great Commission. Um, the command is make disciples. Um, and, uh, and then the, the way that's accomplished is by baptizing and teaching. Uh, we baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we teach them what Jesus has commanded us. Say bye. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll teach for a little while longer and then we'll be ready for them. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, uh, the Great Commission calls us to a life of making disciples by baptizing and teaching. Um, now, you might look at that word order and say, okay, it sounds like you're supposed to baptize first and teach second. You would think that, except that there are other places where a person is taught first and baptized second. And then you begin to realize that it could go either way. Uh, someone may be baptized um, as a child and then grow up being taught or someone might be taught and as they're being taught they say well you know I need to be baptized and then they become baptized so it can go either direction all right so that's the uh, the institution of baptism <clears throat> you'll notice that it's baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit what that means is that um, when someone is baptized, they receive that name into their lives. Um, it's not called names, but name. It's one name because it's one God. Um, and our understanding that it's one God in three persons is in part informed by the way that Jesus says, the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Um, when I was baptized, when you were baptized, this name was put on you with the water. And, uh, and what that that means is, and to use language that's used elsewhere in the Bible, that we are adopted into the family of the Father through the ministry of the Son by the instrumentation and the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, so we're, we're marked by baptism as people who belong in this family. And uh, as I mentioned before, we, um, we receive our Christian name, uh, to use the old term, um, when we are christened <laughs> um, in baptism. And uh, by the way, the word uh, to christen or to baptize, they mean the same thing. Um, 
when you use the term christening, you're accenting that the, the name of Christ that's put on you. When you say the word baptize, you're talking about the experience involving water. But, you know, it's two names for precisely the same thing. Now, you will find uh, those that don't believe that infants should be baptized um, trying to make a distinction. They'll say, well, you weren't really baptized, you were only christened when you were a child. <clears throat> and that's like, you know, all of that, uh, you know, um, you weren't really uh, uh, married, you were only united in holy matrimony. Uh, <laughs> you know, there are two names for the same thing. Uh, but what they're trying to make the distinction, they're saying, oh, well, when just a little water is put on you, you're not dumped all the way under, and when you're just a baby, that's not really a baptism. We will talk in a little bit about um, that, uh, that understanding. Well, actually, since we're in the, the, um, the Great Commission still, we might, uh, might remember... <coughs> that it, um, we're to make disciples of all nations. Let's put this in here for Greek scholars. Panta te ethne. Um, there is no getting around the, the wording in the Greek. Um, this all means all. Now, to say you to go and baptize all those who are over age 12, or something like that, is to uh, certainly change the word all there. Um, we're told to make disciples of all nations, and that um, the indication there is not just some from among all, we're to go out to all. Um, those who say that babies shouldn't be baptized basically are saying that baptism is a two way thing. Or even one way in the opposite direction that Lutherans talked about it. We would say that in baptism, <coughs> God comes to me. In baptism, God puts his name on me. Those who try to say that babies can't be baptized are saying, well, God's doing something and I'm doing something, or even only I am doing something. Uh, Lutherans would reject that whole concept out of hand because the Bible indicates that this um, baptism is connected to a new birth. Now I want you to think about just how much you contributed to your birth. Your birth. Not a whole lot. Except pain, I guess, for your mother. <laughs> but, um, but that was something that um, was done to you. Um, you, didn't, you didn't create yourself in your mother's womb. You didn't um, make yourself come out of your mother's womb. But the Bible definitely connects baptism and birth. <clears throat> uh, it talks about a, a new birth, uh, or birth from above, uh, or born again. All of this kind of language is talked about. Born again of water and the Spirit. Um, if you really look throughout the Bible at all the places where it talks about baptism, including those where it doesn't use the word baptize, but obviously is talking about baptism. Um, <clears throat> if 
you come up with a picture that indicates God is doing something here, and I'm not. But those who, who refuse to baptize infants basically say, oh, baptism is just me obeying God. <clears throat> They'll call it an ordinance, like yeah, God ordered me to do it, and I say, yes, sir, and I go and do it, and when I do that, it proves to God that I really love Him. But that concept just doesn't match up with all the, the, the passages in the Bible, and, and we won't talk about all of them today, but in the back of your catechism, you've got lots of indications of, uh, of these things. So, um, Lutherans look at uh, baptism in the Bible and say the prerequisites for being baptized are you need to be a sinful human being. <laughs> Period. Not you need to understand things on a certain level. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to imagine God setting something up um, to where you have to understand things on a certain level uh, in order to receive his gift because, um, well, for one thing, there are some people that never reach that level. You know, should, should someone who is uh, mentally challenged, who never actually perceives, I mean, you know, you think of their, um, um, one of the secretaries at the seminary had adopted a young girl um, when she was a baby who was severely mentally disabled and physically disabled as well. Um, she lived to be about 21 years old. Um, she was in diapers her entire life. She never spoke. She never fed herself. Um, she did smile, <laughs> and, uh, and her smile was just amazing. And her mother loved her very much, and so did everybody who knew her. Um, but she would not qualify for baptism under the requirements that are put out there by those who say that infants can't be baptized. Um, so, we, uh, we would need to amend that all nations, I guess, to say all nations with an IQ of at least so-and-so, um, all nations with um, the ability to grasp certain concepts, which concepts the smartest person in the world can't really comprehend. You know, see, that's my other struggle with that. Um, you have to really understand Jesus as your Lord and Savior and understand the full impact of your sinfulness before you can be baptized. I don't know anybody that does that. <laughs> and to try and say, well, you just at this certain point, you know. I don't get it. Um, so, uh, as Lutherans, we believe that um, God's gift his power, His Holy Spirit operates in our lives and He does something in baptism and we receive. Uh, interestingly, baptism is something you can't do for or to yourself. There, um, if you look at the, the Greek word, it doesn't have the capability. In, in English, um, well, do you know the concept of reflexive? Like the reflexive pronouns are the ones that refer back to the one who's speaking, you know, my. It would be a reflexive pronoun. Um, in, uh, in Greek, you just, with the word itself, baptism is something that is done to you by someone else can't baptize yourself. Um, it is, when you, and when you are baptized, you are not active in any way. You are purely passive. You are purely receiving. Uh, 
this led Luther to say that baptism is the gospel. That is, because it, it by, by its very nature, is so purely passive, um, it's so much done by someone to someone, that helps you to see the gospel, where God is the one who's doing something, and I am the one who's receiving. And there's no possibility that I can do something for him. He's doing it all for me. So, um, consequently, Lutherans would reject any idea of requiring someone to be of a certain age or a certain mental ability to receive this gift. It's a gift from God. Uh, what do you have to do to qualify to receive a gift? I guess you have to exist. <laughs> but that would be about it. <clears throat> if I've got $100, I could give it to my best friend because he's my best friend, or I could give it to a cat, you know? <laughs> Not that I would mind to. <laughs> but we all know that there have been a number of very wealthy people who have died leaving their pets as their heirs. <clears throat> it's certainly possible. All right, then. Well, uh, we should take, uh, take a little time for our break since uh, Bonnie uh, was so generous to come, so we'll, we'll stop at this point. <laughs>